Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Samad here from VBind Education Technologies, Mumbai. And uh, VBind brings industry experts live into your classrooms. And to help you understand better what exactly we do, I'm going to play a very short video. Rohan and Rita are engineering students. They are studious and smart. They work hard and get good grades. It's a happy story. Comes the villain. They are confused about their future. They find no connect with the subjects they study and what career they want to pursue. Professor Nandlal is a very senior lecturer. He has sensed this issue with many other students like Rohan and Rita. He is worried too. He sets out on a mission to find a solution. He does some research, tries to find out who can help him bring the real corporate world into the classroom. He wants someone to help students gain knowledge and experience of the practical world. And voila, what does he find? VBind, bringing industry to classroom. VBind has a list of industry experts as masters on their platform. By means of VBinders, these masters interact with students like you. These VBinders are called Masterclass. What do we expect from a masterclass? Stories of inspiration and experience, tons of information and new products and the ideas behind it, useful insights on how to step into the industry, chance to interact and pitch ideas to the movers and shakers of the industry. One such masterclass is waiting for you. Come, let's hear the master. And yes, don't forget to like us on Facebook or tweet to us at WeBind. We appreciate your feedback by just a WhatsApp on 0887916325288. We promise to bring the Tatas and Bansals and the Murtis to you soon. Help us get them live on your screens. So the topic for today is uh, image processing, its application and career scope. And uh, for this, we have uh, Ms. Devangini Patel joining us from Finland. So Ms. Patel is a research scholar at uh, Olo University at Finland with more than uh, five years of experience in this field. So without any further delay, I invite Ms. Patel to take over. Over to you, madam. So thank you, uh, Vibind, for giving me this opportunity, first of all. So first, I mean, I'd like to uh, share my presentation. Um, so can you just give me a few minutes to set that up? Okay, so can you uh, see this and then I'll start? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, we find cameras all around us. You can see surveillance cameras. You have your own mobile phones. And then we have these uh, flying drones, which have cameras attached to them. Then we have these social robots, which have cameras for understanding the world around them. And then we have Cameras also behind the cars that help us to park them. And then we have Google Glass. So we have so many cameras around them, but the only thing that they do is just see the world around them and present it as it is. It's only humans that have got to see it. And uh, then excuse me, sorry to interrupt, madam. Uh, we are not able to see this uh, presentation very clearly. It's a bit blurred. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see it now? Yes, it's better now. Okay. So shall I like uh, go to the previous slide or continue? 
So if you can please repeat, it would be uh, very helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have a lot of cameras around us. Like we have surveillance cameras, seeing the people around different buildings. Then we have our own mobile cameras by which we take videos and selfies. Then we have drones which can fly at different heights and to different places. And then we have cameras also in our cars for helping us to park and also to drive our cars automatically. And we have robots with eyes so that they can see the world and understand it. And then we have cameras also in the Google Glass. But what's the use if you can just see what the camera sees, if there's no understanding of what's happening around? So if you just have these dumb cameras, you always need a person to supervise what's going on. You need a person to tell that, okay, we need to break the car, or we need the person to tell that, okay, uh, there's a burglar around the house. We need to wake up now. So that's why we have computer vision and machine vision to actually help us. Like, as I've been told, you guys know a bit about image processing. So just to like revise that, image processing is just a set of algorithms which convert one image matrix to another one. But computer vision and machine vision are a bit more further developed um, field where they want to make sense of these pixels. So what does this matrix actually represent? Maybe it can represent an apple, a banana, So one field is machine vision. That is for providing sense to machines. So for instance, you have a machine in the assembly line and you have different objects, like a good apple or a bad apple. So it will distinguish these two and then just pick up the good ones and leave the bad ones on the assembly line. Another related field is machine vision. Machine vision is very close to the human vision. It is more biologically based and tries to understand the world around just like human beings do. Many people say that computer vision and machine vision are similar. And I would also agree because the set of methods and techniques used in both of these are the same. Just to give a brief introduction about computer vision, the three main areas are recognition, reconstruction, and reorganization. Recognition deals with identifying individual objects. For instance, in this image, the algorithm has identified a car, a person sitting on the horse, and another person. Reconstruction deals with trying to combine multiple 2D images and making a 3D image out of this. For instance, you could have um, shot Taj Mahal from different angles and different distances. Then this algorithm would make a 3D reconstruction of the whole Taj Mahal. Another area is reorganization. So this deals with uh, segmenting an image so you try to find out where are the boundaries of each object in the image. Now, since you people have studied image processing, you would be knowing a bit about lines and edges. So these form the basic features in computer vision. And then we also have things like motion, so here we can see an image and we can see that the person is going forward and his hands are going back you, by seeing the arrows in this image. So this red, red arrows actually form the motion data for this image. And once we've got the features in computer vision, we need to describe them. Just like how we humans describe objects in the real world that an apple is round, a banana is long, 
a bottle is cylindrical. The same way we use different features like feature descriptions like the shape, the color, the texture, and things like that to describe it. Then we could use a high level processing algorithm, which could be computer vision based, to actually do some more processing on these descriptors. And then finally, we use some form of machine learning. For instance, if, I, if there's an image of a bad apple and a good apple, we could first use edge detection to segment the apple out and just ignore the background. And once we've got the apple out of the whole image, we could use something like the color. And then just based on color, like whether it's black or red, we can understand whether it's a good apple or bad apple. Just before we go on, I'd like to say a few things about machine learning. Just like computer vision is making sense of the images, machine learning is about making sense of data. And this data could be just the images or it could be features extracted from the images. Let me show you an example. So for instance, uh, you want to make a computer learn whether a person will pay back a car loan. So you will provide the computer with some data that you have got. And then you'll try to understand this relationship using this data. And so the computer will learn that, okay, if the person is earning more, then the chances that he's going to pay back the loan are more. And computer vision uses a lot of machine learning to understand these relationships. So instead of you making the rules that, okay, if the color is red, then it's a good apple, or the color is black, it's a bad apple, you can actually use an automatic method to learn these relationships. So that was a bit about um, image processing and computer vision. I thought it'd be better to uh, explain those things before I talk about myself. So I've done computers, I've done, sorry, bachelor's in computer science from India. I was just like you people, and I've done an image processing course at that time. I'd also done a machine learning course. And for image processing, we were using MATLAB and we were doing simple programs of edge detection, smoothing and those things. So I pretty much understand like what type of um, situation you people are in and how difficult it is maybe to understand these slides. So if you have any questions at the end, I would love to answer them. So yeah, I pretty much did the same thing like you people did about transforming one image into another image using different algorithms. Um, inspired by how actually computers can take decisions automatically based on data, I decided to learn more about artificial intelligence. So I went to University of Southampton and did a master's course there. There, there were many courses, and there was a course on computer vision. And um, also during that time, I did many projects on computer vision, and most of them were using OpenCV and Python. OpenCV is a wonderful library for computer vision. It's very easy to use. It's easy to install. It works on many different hardwares, including mobile phones. And it's not as slow as MATLAB, so it's even used by many startup companies and uh, many industries as well. 
So if you want to do a job in the future, definitely learning OpenCV would help. And there are many tutorials and examples online, which can actually guide you in learning different computer vision algorithms in OpenCV. And there were, and these are some of the images of the projects that I've worked on. On the left, you can see a robot. And uh, my master's thesis was about making this robot recognize itself in the mirror. So the robot just sees itself in the mirror. It doesn't know how it looks like. But using random movements on its face, it's supposed to understand that, okay, it's looking at itself. And on the right hand side, you can see me in a Facebook hackathon. So in this, me and uh, a few people worked on understanding um, the world around us and trying to help a blind person walk. So in this, there were like two cameras mounted on the hardware and the system is just supposed to tell the blind person to walk left or right, walk ahead based on any obstacle that's in front of them or around them. We'll see more uh, examples about this uh, uh, navigation later on. But first of all, I'd like to show you that how really difficult it is to recognize yourself in the mirror. So, in this video, you can see like various animals standing in front of the mirror. Some of them are able to recognize that it's them and some are not. So here, the animals think that they're interacting with another animal. a very primitive sense that is given to humans and we think that making sense of vision is so easy but when you look at how animals and how robots actually process the vision we actually come to know that it's very difficult it's not that easy as you think so computer vision as a field is very very difficult but it's very promising in terms of career prospects and in terms of applications in the real world. And then, right now I'm doing a PhD in computer vision at the University of Oulu. So I do use the things that I've learned in my bachelor's and master's, that's C++, OpenCV, and MATLAB. But um, I've come to realize that, and obviously learn that, just do, using these things is not enough. It's pretty slow. And uh, because of all the race and deep learning, people are now switching, not switching, but also using libraries like Piano, Buddha, DNN, and libraries like this for deep learning. I'll be covering deep learning later on in the lecture so that you understand what it is. My research um, deals basically with micro expressions. Micro expressions are like uh, facial expressions like happy, sad, disgust, anger, surprise. But micro expressions are different in the sense that they only um, come on the face when you're trying to hide your emotions. So if you can just understand facial expressions, you just understand what the person is trying to show you. But if your computer algorithm can understand micro expressions, then you can understand what the person is really feeling. And for doing these things, I'm using computer vision 
and along with deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning and it's also used for computer vision. Now in the right hand side, we can see an image. And this image has been generated using deep learning. So here the deep learning architecture is trying to visualize and imagine how a typical type of dining room would look like. So here you could see some tables, you can see some chairs and things like that. So now I'd like to show you some practical applications. Here we will see Backstore robot, which will try to fold a shirt. Today, Baxter is demonstrating a very simple method for folding a shirt. Starting with the shirt flat on the table, tuck the sleeves in towards the centers so that they lay flat. Watch as Baxter demonstrates this simple technique. Next, grasp the shirt at the shoulder on either side and pull it back. If it's not perfect, just straighten out the shirt as needed. Here is an example of how computer vision can be used for drones. Hi, I'm Raviv, an engineer and a pilot. I've always been fascinated by flying machines. A phone without applications, it's just a brick with a screen. The same way a drone without applications, it's just a brick that flies. This is Percepto. It's a tiny add-on that lets drones have applications on them. Computer vision is the missing link to create those apps. It's what makes drones able to avoid obstacles, recognize people and places, track objects, and really become autonomous. It's also what brings drones to the uncompromising safety level required to become an everyday thing. But creating computer vision applications is a long process of multi-layer development. Say you want to create a simple drone app that finds a parking spot. You need computer vision optimized hardware, custom drivers, a layer of algorithms to analyze and map the image, a layer for safety and common actions, and one to control the drone. Only then you can create the last layer that actually delivers the functionality. The amount of resources needed to create all of this makes no sense for just one product. So we've created it for all of them. Using Percepto, developers can now easily create new types of applications. Rather than years, applications can now be developed in just a couple of weeks. Then, anybody who installed Percepto on their drone can use those apps. Just imagine apps that enable drones to spot humans in disaster zones, deliver flowers, or retrieve balls in a tennis game. The possibilities are endless. We've developed Percepto to be super user-friendly. It's compatible with almost any drone. Installing it is a breeze. And using our smartphone app, users can easily browse and install applications on it. To get you started, we're shipping Percepto with two apps that we've created. The Director is an app that finally realizes the true potential of automated aerial video shoots. And Enrich lets you enjoy first-person view enhanced with augmented reality. Percepto is a community-based product. It will become as amazing as developers make it. We're already working with over 50 of them. And if you're a developer, we'd love for you to join us. Drone owners play a significant role as well. The more people use Percepto, the more creative developers will get. 
We're a team of drone enthusiasts, composed of senior engineers, computer vision specialists, and user experience experts. We believe that the only way to create a true open platform is for everybody to use it. That's why we're creating an open source ecosystem, not a product. It will constantly update with improved algorithms and abilities. It's also the reason we chose to launch an Indiegogo. Your help is not only to get us to the final stage of production, but also to be the people making Percepto what it can be by being a part of this community. So if you love drones and believe they're the future like we do, support us. Let's do this together. So here we saw various computer vision algorithms being used for person detection. You can also recognize different objects. You can understand different actions and understand the world around us. Here is another example. Here, computer vision is used to understand what the robot is seeing and then grasp objects. So here we can not only make an understanding of just what the camera sees, but we can also make robots take particular actions based on what they see. So it's, so computer vision is something like closing the whole loop so, they, so that robots and computer systems can actually react and respond to humans. Here we will see another example where cameras as well as other sensors can be used in a car. PreSafe is the comprehensive protection system from Mercedes-Benz. The supplemental brake assist plus and the PreSafe brake help to prevent or reduce the severity of accidents, thereby protecting other road users. With pedestrian recognition, the pre-safe brake now takes on a new dimension. A stereo camera and a system of long, medium, and short-range radar monitor the area in front of the vehicle. The information is combined and processed in a control unit to provide early recognition of road users in the lane analyzed. At the same time, these data are used to calculate whether there is a risk of collision. If such a risk is identified, the system can provide visual and audible warning at first. If the ever brakes, Brake Assist Plus ensures that the optimal brake pressure is applied, even if the pedal has been pressed too lightly. In critical situations, if the driver does not take action, autonomous braking may take place as necessary. The pre-safe brake with pedestrian recognition can prevent collisions with people at speeds of over 50 kilometers per hour. 
Moreover, the severity of an accident can be reduced significantly at up to 72 kilometers per hour. So we saw a lot of applications which use computer vision. So these types of job would actually require to have image processing and computer vision knowledge. But at the same time, you would be required to have the knowledge of maths, linear algebra, and statistics. These types of jobs also may require to have machine learning because it's with the help of machine learning that you can actually learn the different features to understand different objects. There are a few libraries out there for computer vision and image processing, but most of the industries use OpenCV Some of the research industries use MATLAB, but that is just basically for prototyping and writing the algorithms because um, programming in that language is more faster. But when you think about actually commercializing the product and making it real time, you have to go for a more faster language than MATLAB. So that's why OpenCV is more preferred and OpenCV has many language support, like C++, Python, Java, iOS. And for machine learning, there are many libraries out there. So I would actually advise you to learn machine learning, uh, basic knowledge. And then you can use uh, the library depending upon the language or depending upon certain algorithm requirement. So that is quite flexible. So these are the required skills that people ask for a computer vision engineer. And in many of the job profiles that I've been seeing online, deep learning is also has started coming up. And that's why I'll take time later on in the presentation to just show you a small video which explains what deep learning is. I don't really know whether um, I've given the impression that computer vision is easy or difficult. Even though computer vision programming is interesting, it comes along with a lot of challenges it has a lot of unsolved problems. Only in the last few decades have problems like uh, face recognition, like un, um, identifying, okay, this is Amitabh Bachchan, for instance, that, uh, that has become quite accurate, like 99%. But there are a lot of open problems like navigation that's still not so accurate. And computer vision is not so easy. For instance, if person detection accuracy is 99%, then in one out of 100 times, there's a possibility that it might miss a person and it might run over the person. So 99.9% .9 accuracy is not enough. We need 100% accuracy. So besides the algorithm, there are many problems in the input data itself. For instance, the image can be very noisy. It can be very dark. So in that case, you can't locate the edges and the features properly. And it might also change the feature descriptors. For instance, on the right-hand side, we can see some faces. So if the image is too dark, 
then here the faces might not even be detected. And in the lower portion, we can see actually images captured during um, using near infrared cameras. So these cameras actually allow light from a certain bandwidth other than the visible region. And this is independent of the illumination in the room. So then we can use computer, computer vision algorithms on such type of images. So there are these types of solutions as well for tackling it. But in this case, we can't understand the color. So we cannot get other information that we might need. So in that case, just having a simple camera, a simple RGB camera is not enough. So we might also need to add other sensors. For instance, in the Mercedes-Benz car, they used radar as well. And then another problem is that the computation speed is low. That is because the computer vision algorithms take a lot of time. So we need to optimize them. We need to implement them in a way that they don't take a lot of time. And people don't really like to wait lot of time. For instance, uh, you've gone to a robot and you're asking the robot, please bring me a cup of coffee. And the robot goes there in a minute to the coffee table. He sees the coffee mug on the table. But just to understand where is it located at what, at what depth, at what height. If it takes like five minutes, then the person will become like angry or then why do we need such a computer vision system if it is taking a lot of time? Humans actually expect automatic systems to work quite fast. So that's why it's up to us to actually make the computer vision algorithms fast and real time. One way is to actually improve the hardware. We can run uh, these computer vision algorithms on a normal hardware. But some algorithms will need a lot of hardware and these hardwares are quite costly. And, uh, and for specific applications like deep learning, researchers and uh, computer vision scientists have now started using GPUs the same GPUs that are used for gamers. And because of that, the cost has reduced. Now, NVIDIA has also in introduced a GPU which is for mobile and um, embedded applications. And it's costing like uh, $1,000. So this is something which is really positive for our field. So if you think in terms of hardware, Things are going positive and, and going slowly, slowly. So if you think that uh, computer vision algorithms are easy, there are a number of challenges. And as scientists and uh, engineers, we've got to tackle them. And there are many positives of uh, doing a computer vision job. There are many potential applications as we saw in the videos. Nowadays, many things are getting automated. And, uh, and many robots are coming there in our social world, in industries. So there is a huge market potential. And uh, BCC analysts, have shown the statistic that uh, the image processing market was worth $2,000 billion in 2015, and is predicted to grow at an annual rate of 28.1% between 2016 and 2017. And here we can see another graph, which is actually showing the revenue increase in different markets, which are making up the computer vision.
So we can all see even around us that we have uh, many devices and many applications which have started including computer vision. Even in India, there are, many there are some computer vision startup companies and even uh, big companies which are having computer vision projects. And even around the world, in Europe, in North America, in UK, in Australia, people are really, really innovating, making different applications, not only in computer vision, but in the broader field of artificial intelligence. So if you're really interested in making something different, then definitely computer vision is something that can promise you that challenge in life. And uh, finally, I'd like to share the latest development in computer vision, that's deep learning. Hi, I'm Nat. I'm Lo. And this is our 20% project, where we go find out about different Google stuff we're curious about. Last year, we got to make a documentary about how voice search works. And that was the first time we heard about something called machine learning. Since then, we've been kind of fascinated by it. So today, we're talking with Greg and Chris to learn more about it. How would you describe machine learning to someone? Well, there's a lot of problems it's really easy to solve with computers. Computers can go and like simulate how galaxies move and how the courses of asteroids going and how close they're going to come to Earth. I could never hope to go and do that, but I can go and do this, this problem like recognizing that that's a tree, which is so much tremendously more difficult for a computer. It doesn't feel like intelligence to us because it's so effortless as a human being to do it, but for a computer, it's actually really hard. Because the real world is kind of messy and unpredictable at times. The strict logical rules that go into traditional programming just don't work. Instead of going and, and writing programs to, that solve the problem, we, we write programs that learn to solve the problem from examples. And it's this process of learning that allows them to improve over time and to actually be more clever than they would be if we wrote down a very rigid set of instructions for them to follow. Machine learning is in so many different things that we use today that it's kind of like this invisible magic ingredient. Phones with the ability to understand human speech. Machine translation, email spam filters. When you go to the ATM and you give a check and it can read the handwriting. Or a photos app that can automatically organize your photos based on the things that you like to take photos of. Like, here are all my mountain photos, here are all my food photos. Here, here are all my dog photos. Here are all my feet photos. <laughs> Everything from facial recognition to going and trying to recognize whether a particle is present in a particular collision at the LHC. Which we would just like to take a time out to say is that big tube in the ground over in Europe that smashes particles together at really fast speeds so that scientists can use that information to unlock the mysteries of the universe, among other cool things. Now back to our episode, because I am getting really dizzy doing this. Ooh, ooh. So researchers and scientists are still experimenting and trying to find the best ways to teach computers how to learn. But a lot of the progress is coming from these algorithms that are based roughly on how the human brain works, and these are called artificial neural networks. So an artificial neural network is something that it's a rough mathematical cartoon of, of how a biological neural network works. In a biological brain, we have individual cells called neurons. Each neuron looks at what its neighbors has to say and then decide what it wants to say. And in artificial neural networks, we have little mathematical functions. We put them in some organized st structure, and then we say, OK, you guys all together, learn to do this task. We have lots of neural nets that are really great at going and recognizing, you know, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a frog, this is a mouse, this is a horse, this is a truck, and things like that. So take, for example, trying to recognize what this is. So it used to be that we were really proud if we could get a neural net with three layers to work. Um, and it's recently that we've made a lot of progress on techniques that allow us to train much deeper neural nets. And that's why this kind of machine learning is also called deep learning. A neuron in the bottom layer is just going to be looking at a tiny piece of the picture and making some computations about it. It doesn't understand anything about dogs specifically. But what the neuron does understand is it says, I'm giving a signal that's useful 
for somebody who's giving a signal, who's giving a signal, who's giving a signal, who's giving a signal. They're kind of able to unfurl this really high dimensional knot and pull it apart and make it easier to go and, and uh, you know, separate different things that are, are, are close together on the surface from things that are, are were tangled all together earlier. But then at the top, we'll put two neurons, and these neurons look at the whole picture so far. They're basically experts at making the final call, figuring out, oh, all the layers below me said these things, so I know that this is a dog, or at least I'm 92.4% sure that it's a dog, so it's basically a dog. And while there's been a whole lot of progress with teaching computers to learn, they're still much slower learners than we are, and they make mistakes that you and I wouldn't. So what I was working on is sort of trying to find a way to go and look at a neural net and ask, what does the neural net think the platonic ideal of a cat is, or the platonic ideal of a dog, or anything it can classify as? And suddenly you can go and ask, you know, neural net, what do you think cat looks like? And you get a picture of a cat, or, you know, neural net, what do you think a barbell looks like? So these weights. And it, it, it goes and it shows you a picture not only of a barbell, but of an arm attached to a barbell. So the model thought that the arms, you know, it only learned what barbells were from looking at pictures of barbells, and they're often held by muscular weightlifters. And so, so it, it learned that there was, you know, barbells have arms attached to them. It takes them a long time to learn. You show it a picture of a school bus when it's early in learning. The very next time you show it a picture of a school bus, it's only a little bit more likely to say school bus. It doesn't get it even though that was the very last thing it saw. Whereas, you know, you say to a kid, you know, that's a filing cabinet. And then a second later you say, what's that? Yeah. He's not going to be like, shoo, right? You know. Well, like, <laughs> the more you describe this, the more I'm amazed by human beings. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the effect is like, wow, human beings are really amazing. <laughs> We're really amazing learning machines. Oh. <gasps> <gasps> So I hope um, I was able to actually share some meaningful knowledge to you all and I was able to inspire you about computer vision. So thank you. Uh, so I think this was uh, one of our most uh, amazing sessions we have ever had. Uh, so students, we are open for questions. Amal Jyoti Kovic, I am uh, unmuting you right now. Okay. Uh, is there any questions from Amal Jyoti College, Kerala? Hello, is it audible? Yes. Oh, yes. Hello? Yes, hello. Hello, miss. Uh, my question is, how can we, as students, how can we integrate this, uh, this software in our programs? Are so, just yes, complete your question first. How can we use this vision software in our the software, in the software that students make? So, when I was doing masters, I made several projects which um, lasted maybe like a day, a few days, or a few weeks. And they were like pretty simple. So maybe just taking a webcam, attaching it to your laptop first, getting those images, and maybe trying to understand like, like this portion of the image is a face. Then uh, maybe recognizing your friends or um, recognizing different objects. Now, when you ask the question, like, where exactly you can use it in your projects? So, for instance, um, you have a project of making a system that greets you when you enter the house. So, you want to make a smart home, for instance. So in that case, you can put a camera at the front of your house and do recognition of each person that enters your house. So yes, your projects have to be a bit futuristic or like it 
can't be very um, like old style, you can say, like making a simple website. It has to be something that is relevant in today's world. Maybe something like, okay, you're taking your phone to the grocery market and you're trying to understand that what is the vegetable that you're seeing? You don't know what it is. So you'll take a photograph of that. And then you have an Android application, for instance, that um, loads that image. And then you tell the user that, okay, this is a pumpkin or something like that. So your projects have to be more related to computer vision than being just simple. And then definitely you can use computer vision for your projects. So have I answered your question well? well Okay, thank you. Are there more questions from your side? Yeah, so are no more questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gitam University, are there any questions from your end? Okay, we have got a question from uh, Professor Rajesh. Uh, so if you can just have a look at the chat box. Mm -hmm, yes. So first of all, I like to say out the question so that other people know. So um, the question is like, the applications of computer vision, machine vision in medical field can be huge. But how do we take care of accuracy and low cost? So yes, you're right. There are actually many applications in medical field being used right now. And if I talk about my own research group, then computer vision is used for cancer detection. It's used for even a heartbeat detection. So you have a camera which observes a person. And just by observing a person, it can detect the heart rate. Or you can take x-rays, you can take MRIs, and you can understand them. You can use computer vision for that. And when you talk about accuracy, then yes, uh, you need more data for computer vision algorithms to be more accurate. So it's not much to do with the algorithm side, but more to do with the data side. And yes, um, so if you have more data, you need to tune the algorithms. But first of all, the question is getting the data. So first, if you get the data, like a huge amount of data set, maybe in uh, 10,000 or 100,000 images, and then we can move on to the computer vision algorithm and making it more better. And when you talk about low cost, then um, it really depends like how much hardware does your computer vision algorithm require and as years have progressed, the hardware cost has gone down and down and down. And uh, if your revenue is going to be huge, then definitely cost shouldn't be a big problem. Uh, would you like to ask any more questions about this? Yes, so I okay. think that uh, answers Professor Ajay's question. Okay, thank you. There's a th uh, thank you, Chair chat box from uh, Mr. Rajesh. Okay, so that is uh, about it, about the uh, session on image processing. And uh, we thank you from the VBind team, from all the colleges for uh, sparing the time and sharing your experience and knowledge. Thank you once again. Thank you. Have a nice day.